Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our back in our Father's Word, Book of Jeremiah. You know, we just finished the 13th chapter where God told Jeremiah, you take an old girdle and you take it down, you put it in a, hide it in a rock. And what it was is God wanted to wear his children around him, to be proud of them, to feel good. But he said, when pull that old marred, filthy, uh, moth-eaten girdle out to mildewed, that's what my children feel like around me. They're just no good. They won't love me. They won't worship me. I don't want that girdle around me. And when, when his children, a good analogy of what it's like when you displease our father. You know, he does have feelings. And we're going to find out in this 14th chapter, th this will be intercession for Judah. Our father, we, we can detect part of his, some of his feelings in this particular chapter. Having said that, a word of wisdom from our father, Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our father, and it reads, The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. Now, this drought of the end times is not for water. It's for the latter rain, all right, but it's for truth. The deception and false teaching, um, rapture doctrines, things contrary to the word of God are abound. Our father's not happy with it. Verse 2, Judith mourneth, um, and the gates thereof languish. They are black unto the ground and the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. Uh, they're starving for truth, and there's just none in them. And, and so it is that uh, when the latter rain doesn't come, that is to say God's word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, people are lost. And their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters, that's to say their slaves, their, their workers, sent them down to get water, they came to the pits and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. Uh, they, they were dumb as to what was going on. But when they went down to draw fresh water, the ground was parched and cracked. Why? Because Christ is the living water. And when you leave Christ, out, the true Christ, out of the equation, and bring in the false Christ and his rapture doctrine, you got a lot of hurt going on. That's a drought that God feels bad about. Uh, that's only one of the things the false one teaches. Verse 4, because the ground is chapped, it's cracked. For there was no rain in the earth, and the plowmen, the farmers, were ashamed. They covered their heads. Nothing could produce. Now, when, when um, you, our Heavenly Father uses agriculture as an analogy in many things. And when you take that viewpoint, a little bit of horticulture and so forth, you know what happens when a plant doesn't have water. It dies on the vine. And spiritually speaking, if you cut a soul, one of God's children, away from the true word of God, I'm talking about the absolute truth from his word, they are listless. They have no purpose. They wish wash. They, they look for something to believe in. And they'll grab the first thing that comes along that seems logical, though it's illogical. How, how strange it is when a nation is void of truth, how listless the people, the government, everything tends to be. Verse 5. Yea, the hind also calved in the field. The, the 
cattle, they dropped their calves and forsook it because there was no grass. There was no need. It died of starvation. If, if You know, there's got to be good pasture from God's Word to feed upon lushly legumes that just overflow your mind with truth and blessings from Almighty God. When you listen to some ratchet jaw that never quite cracks the book open, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. You're playing church. Verse 6, And the wild ass did stand in the high places. Um, they snuffed up the wind like dragons. That's to say like jackals. Their eyes did fail. They were glazed over because of the drought, uh, because there was no grass. They were starving. And, you know, this is how it is written. If you think this doesn't hold true even in the New Testament, Romans chapter 11, God sent the spirit of slumber, it's recorded in English. The Greek is stupor. He put the spirit of stupor upon the people. Look at them. They are in a stupor when they do not have the truth. They do not know which way to turn. Verse 7, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. In other words, God, you promised that you wouldn't destroy us just for your name's sake. We're going to keep on sinning, but, but do it for your name's sake. That's the wrong attitude, my friend. That's not going to get it done with our Father. You're, you, you must be responsible for your actions. You must face the fact and stay focused on your own self. And you must work with what you have to work with. The knowledge that you have, you must, you must polish it, exercise it through the Word of God, whereby you become brighter each day in the glory of the living God, to whereby you're not starved. And you must do it on your own. That's the only way God will love you. You can't just ask Him for His sake to forgive you. You've got to repent and deserve it. Eight. Oh, the hope of Israel the Savior thereof in time of trouble. Why shouldest thou be as a stranger in the land and as a wayfaring man that turneth away to tarry for a night? You know, that would not be a good way to talk to our Father. Call him a wayfaring man. You don't have time for us. You're off messing around somewhere and and you're... you're um, uh, you just um, are basically gone from us. You've ignored us. How quick do you think? You see, you know, you might say, well, people surely wouldn't do that. Well, what if they turn to another Christ, another ratchet jaw teaching? They're talking with, with what they believe is truth, though they're talking to a false Christ, a false Savior. They're not going to give the time of the day to the truth. And they're going to think every moment that they're doing exactly right. Don't shake their boat. Don't wake them up. But to accuse God of tarrying when it's your fault is not a very wise thing to do. Verse 9. What shouldest thou be as a... Why, rather, shouldest thou be as a man of stone, as a mighty man that cannot say, Yet thou, O Lord, art in the midst of us, and we are called by thy name. Leave us not. Just because we're called by your name, just because we call ourselves Christians, you save us. We deserve it. Oh, I wouldn't count on that. You know, it, uh, Father is, his spirit is all around us. But you have to pay a little bit of, of uh, respect. This is very disrespectful. You talk about uh, insubordination. This is insubordination to the highest degree to talk to the living God this way. You're cruising for a bruising. Verse 10, Thus saith the Lord unto this people. This is what i got to say to him, he says. Thus have they loved to wonder. They have not refrained their feet. 
therefore the Lord doth not ex accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. He's talking about the ten tribes here that went north after the captivity that settled. They, they kind of have a way of drifting away from the promises of God. Many of them don't even realize they are the house of Israel. Not Judah. The house of Judah is separate. And God said, this is what i got to say to them. They wandered. Their old feet just keep traveling. And they don't even know who they are. And then they called me a stone. Called me astonished. Verse 11. Then said the Lord unto me, pray not for this people for their good. Don't you ask me to bless them. Verse 12. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by pestilence. Do you, do you understand? Are you keeping up with the stages of the locusts in these end times? The consumer is the fourth and final stage of the locust. God's letting you know, I'm also a consumer. I'm a consuming fire. And uh, so w what you want to pay attention to is the consuming locust, all right. But most of all, to know our Father has a consuming fire that is his Holy Spirit that touches and warms your heart, but it burns that that is evil. It does away with all evil. Well, what do you do then? I would say you better repent. You better get it right. Otherwise, God could care less. He, he gave you a mind. You have the ability to use it. He wrote you a letter telling you exactly how it's going down. If you haven't read it to protect yourself, I'm sorry, you're out of luck. Now, many might say, well, partner, I can't read. Well, that's why he sends teachers to read for you. There's no excuse. You have to be responsible for your life as it is and what you have to work with. And to most of all, to love your father and ask for his help. Ask for his forgiveness. Otherwise, as long as long, you, you must understand, as long as you are dealing with a false messiah and listening to false teachers, he doesn't want anything to do with you, and nor should he. Verse 13, Then said I, O Lord God, behold the prophets say unto them, You shall not see the sword, neither shall you have famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. O Lord, their prophets tell them, You don't have to understand the word of God. <laughs> Why? Why would you not worry about the sword and the word? Because you're going to be gone. You're going to fly out of here. And there's just one problem. That's false. That is not biblical. I don't care how many churches teach it. It is not true. You add to the word of God when you teach that flyaway doctrine. Christ is coming here to establish the kingdom of God. Where do you want to go? And it is stated very clearly that naturally those that are asleep, where, the, where they get their rapture doctrine, the subject is where are the dead? They're with the Lord, and he's going to bring many of them with him to help teach and straighten out this miserable earth age where people so try to put God out of their vocabulary, try to go their own ways. He said, any wonder that God is disgusted with them. I will not hear them, he said. I just wish God would bless me. Well, then get in his word. Be responsible. Think for yourself. Prove every man, this one or any other one or woman, that teaches God's word. You can always do that real simply by checking them out in God's word. It's that simple. Verse 14. Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, a false revelation, and a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. It's mixed. 
You know, there's one way you can really tell real quick. If God has a ministry, it won't be a begging ministry. They don't beg for money. Okay. They don't say, well, God said you should plant a little seed here and a little seed there. Call it money. How about planting the seed is the word of God, not money. Matthew chapter 13. How about spreading a little of God's true word whereby it brings people out of a dry starving land and let them have truth from God's word where they have a foundation Christ to stand on and be blessed by God rather than ignored. God's making it pretty plain here. They're lying to you. And this is why Jesus would say in Mark chapter 13, one of his first warning, Many will come in my name saying they are Christ. Many, many, many people will call themselves Christian preachers, but I didn't send them. Don't let them deceive you. Well, how could a lay person tell whether they're teaching God's word or not? If it's not the word of God, whose word is it? Verse 15. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name. And I sent them not. They say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. God is a consuming fire. You know, judgment begins at the pulpit. You ever take on the, uh, the line of teaching God's word, you better know judgment begins with you. Therefore, you had better do your homework well, and you better know what you're talking about. It had better be God's word you're teaching, not some yo-yos. And, well, how, how, again, it's so simple a child can understand. Well, how can I tell whether they're teaching God's word or not? There's only one word that will lift you, fill you, and mainly bring blessings from God, that's his word in obeying him and following him with love and understanding and striving to exercise your faith and exercise your knowledge whereby you're in the word. That's to say his word. Verse 16. And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them. Then their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. What we're talking about here is deception and people that are spiritually dead. Have you ever walked into a place that's supposed to be teaching God's word and you can feel it the moment you step in? It's spiritually dead. There's no truth there. There's no blessings of God there. And you know that if Christ himself approached at that door, they probably wouldn't let him in. How fantastic it is, uh, to, that is to say, to teach the truth. They would probably call the truth sacrilegious. They call you a crackpot if you teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. In so doing, they call God a crackpot. That's not healthy for them. The sword will be after them. Incidentally, do you know what this two-edged sword is that cuts both ways? Have you ever read the book of Revelation? Have you ever heard what God has to say about it? You can read it in Revelation chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Christ's tongue is a two-edged sword. That is the, his word. And the word of God does cut both ways. And so it is that truth will always, um, it may cut a little, but it'll heal over perfect. Because truth binds. Truth raises up. Truth brings the blessings of God. And when you have the blessings of God, it doesn't matter what the world says. Verse 17, Therefore thou shalt say this word unto them. This is what you're going to pass out to them. 
Let mine eyes run down with tears night and day, and let them not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach, with a very grievous blow. Now, Christ is coming back to this earth at the second advent. He's coming to take a virgin bride. As we noticed in the close of the last chapter, he said there in verse 26 of chapter 13, Therefore will I discover thy skirts upon thy face, that thy shame may appear. I have seen, mine, I have seen thine adulteries and thy names, the lewdness of thy whoredoms, and thine abominations on the hills and the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem! Wilt thou not be made clean? When shall it once be? Well, it's going to be at the second advent when God cleans house. He drove out the money changers before. It's going to be a lot more severe this time. He's not coming back as a babe to be crucified, but as, a, as the king of kings and lord of lords with a rod of iron. He's going to put things in order. So naturally, if Christ returns and expects to find a virgin bride, this is why he says in Mark 13, Woe to you that are with child when I return. He's not talking about a mother carrying a child in her womb. He's talking about you that are spiritually impregnated in your mind and spirit by the false teaching of the false Christ. And he's expecting a virgin bride? And you've been in the sack with Satan? Do you think, how, how well do you, how quick do you think he wants to take you in that great wedding? I tell you what, you missed it. You you have to do with the first Messiah that comes along, which you were warned of in Mark 13. You're not going to make the wedding. This is why, as it is written in the Scripture, many people run up to Christ and say, "Oh Jesus, Jesus, we've in our church we've healed in your name." He said, "You get out of my sight. I never knew you." Wrong, Jesus, friend. There's two of them. Has your church taught you that? to continue. If I go forth into the field, then behold the slain with the sword. If I enter into the city, then behold them that are sick with famine. Yea, both the prophet and the priest go about into a land that they know not. They're speaking things that they don't know. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, they never get into the manuscripts. They never get into the Word of God. They carry on their deception like it's the Holy Word, Holy Joes, holier than thou. Why, why then can we not have God's Word taught with understanding where your family can be blessed and where you can take part in that great wedding that's coming when Christ returns? are gathering back to him. You don't, you don't want to miss that, my friend. You don't want to be deceived. I, I really don't think anyone likes to be taken advantage of and deceived. And that's what Satan is very good at, is deception, lies, misleading. You know, you might say, well, uh, how would Satan do that? Well, Christ gave, he get, always gives us the example in, in Mark chapter 4 and in Matthew 4, he was taken into the wilderness to be tested. Why? Tempted. To show you how to, to withstand temptation. Well, how did Satan tempt him? With Scripture. With the Word of God. That's the way Satan operates. A false prophet. And there are many false ones that follow him. False prophets. False preachers teaching a doctrine that doesn't exist in God's Word. God doesn't like it. He said, do not even pray for those people. Sensible, my friend. I don't care who you are. I don't care what group you associate with. Check them out in the Word of God. Well, I, I can take the preacher's word for it. No, you can't. Because a lot of them are false. You've got to do it yourself. Team. The people will say, 
Hast thou utterly rejected Judah, the house of Judah? Hath thy soul loathed Zion? Why hast thou smitten us? And there is no healing for us. We look for peace and there is no good. And for the time of healing, and behold, trouble, 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 trouble. Satan promises peace, 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 and there will be no peace. He comes in prosperously and peacefully. That's why so many people will be deceived. Why will they be deceived? They haven't had the latter rain, that is to say the truth from God's word, to strengthen them, to give them common sense, knowledge so simple a child can understand from the word of God. That, you know, he, Christ made it very clear in Matthew 24, in Mark, in, in Mark 13, in Luke 21, and many places in John. The real Christ does not return to this earth until after the false one does. That's why he said, if they say he's in the field, don't you dare go, or you'll be deceived. So, and for the elect's sake, as it's written in Mark 13, he shortened the time even, or no, no flesh would be saved. That's how convincing the, the liars are. So you have to be on guard and you have to be alert how precious it is to have truth, to know. You know, do you think our father cries? He said he did. He's run down. Why? He loves his children. The controversy between he and Satan, and Satan has his way with his kids over and over and over. And naturally that makes our father sad. It would make any father sad. And so it is that Satan keeps winning and winning and winning. But the time is coming and what God is telling here in this 19th verse, there's going to be trouble, 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 and losing, losing, losing. You don't want to lose your salvation, my friend. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But a lot of people can sure leave him through ignorance or listening to false pastors and teachers. Again, check them out. It doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything. And it isn't difficult to check out in the Word of God. The Word of God is quite simple, quite uh, actually. If you if you know how the beginning, how it was in the beginning, you will pretty well know how the end. It's like opening an old feed sack. If you get the thread going right, it opens real easy. Well, so does God's Word. But you got to get a start in the beginning to have it open to the end, and know what happened in the garden. Know how the false seed got here, as Jesus explains in Matthew 13 and, and John chapter 8, verse 44. God loves his children. He does want them to hear him. Next verse, please. Verse 20. We acknowledge, O Lord, our wickedness and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against thee. This is the people's word of the elect today. We know that. We know that the people sin against God. That gives you no excuse to. And, and um, those that won't align with it, you don't even want to pray for them. The only thing you could pray is that they wake up. 21. Do not abhor us. This is the elect. This is you speaking. And we ask our Father that. Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember, break not thy covenant with us. That covenant is, well, well just what was it? Well, do you remember it? It's something I don't want you to forget. Um, and, and I've mentioned it several times. How, how difficult is it to be pleasing to God? What was that covenant? Chapter 7, verse 23. I'm going to repeat it for you. But this thing command I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. And you shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you. That's the commands, the covenant that it may be well with you. That's all that's required. That is so simple, to follow God's covenant. Honor that covenant. Well, there, there, but you might say, well, for his name's sake, no. 
for you obeying his word, for you loving him. See, there are a lot of conditions in that. It's real simple. But he said, if you'll follow my covenant, that's this word, I'll bless you. You leave this out of the, equa the equation of your life, and you're going to be in a heap, a heap of hurt because you're without the word of God. If you're out without the word of God and the word is God, you're without God. Well, what God are you with then? Uh, there's a, only one other strong contender, and that's Satan himself, the prince of lies, the king of lies, the dunghill. You don't want to go there. You want to be with our Father. Verse 22 to continue. And there are among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain. Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? Do you, well, we could dance. We could put on a show. Or can the heavens give showers? Not unless God says so. Art not thou he, O Lord God? Therefore we will wait upon thee. Not Satan, not some false preacher, not some um, uh, money changer that wants seed money, but to wait on God himself through his word exercising your mind in that word for thou has made all these things god made them uh, the gentiles they're little off gods they can dance and they can pray and so forth it is almighty god the creator that brings rain what is that rain it ceases the drought the rain we're talking about here is the latter rain which is the true word of god only god can alleviate the ignorance and bring in that rain that is the latter rain and truth of the end times whereby you do not starve, your farm does not starve, your job does not starve, your family does not starve. You are blessed by the living God. That's so simple. All it requires is responsibility on your part to love him. Not pull away from him and expect some special favor just because uh, God created your soul. To expect favors from him because you honor his covenant. Chapter 7, verse 23. Don't ever forget it. It's real simple to please God. If you want his blessings or, hey, if you want to be out there in the cold, have a good trip. Don't miss any of these lectures in Jeremiah. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination or organization. We don't judge people. We have a judge. It's our father. He doesn't need our help. He can handle that job all by himself. You do have the right to spiritually discern. You should. It's a gift from God to know what you should hear, what you should listen to. Hopefully, it's going to be the Word of God. 
and be blessed by him. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request. You don't need a number or an address. Why? Father knows what you're thinking even. You don't have to say it out loud. You know, he created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Your fingerprints are different. You're unique. Why? Because God wanted somebody just like you, but he wanted you to love him. He created you for his pleasure, as it is written in Revelation chapter 4. How long has it been since you pleasured him? You do that by letting him know that you love him. Let's go to his throne. Father, around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. All right, question time. We're going to go with Patty from Kentucky. I know that Christ sits at the right hand of God. Who sits at the left? And please document. Nobody. Okay. And who is Christ? Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, A virgin shall conceive, and it will have a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, being translated as God with us. There are dimensions in the flesh, and there are dimensions in the spirit. Uh, one person, this is why God would say, let us create man in our image. Nobody shares the throne with the living God. And it is almost um, not a good thing to ask who's on the throne with God. Only he is able to fill that throne. That's where Satan got in trouble, was trying to sit on the mercy seat. Nobody sits on the mercy seat, but our Father and the triune Godhead, including the Spirit of God, which is to say the Holy Spirit. There's only one God. Don't be a worshiper of anything other than that. Christ was God with us. Carol from Arkansas. Where in the Bible does it talk about God being the evergreen or the fir tree? Uh, Hosea chapter 14, verse 8. Hosea chapter 14, verse 8. It's kind of Hosea's prayer, the last verses are. And God makes that statement. I am a, as a great fir tree. Well, it's evergreen. It never dies, the leaves in the wintertime. It's always, which his, he is eternal. And that is why that tree becomes symbolic in many people's minds of eternal life. They don't worship it. It's just a similitude as to God himself. Isaiah, uh, Hosea, rather, chapter 14, verse 8, you'll find it. Uh, don't, you know, Babylon always tries to take something and rob the truth of God's word. Whether it be a flood, whether it be the tree, whether it be many things. Don't, don't let Satan take away the beauty of God's own creation. Uh, Diane from Nevada, are we supposed to worship the Trinity even though the Bible says a lot of times to worship but one God? So as Christians, are we supposed to worship the Trinity? Do you only worship God? God is the Trinity. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. St. John chapter 14. St. John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. There are many mansions. Mano in the Greek, it means resting place, not some house, not some fancy building. It means to find peace of mind through the Holy Spirit, where the Father and the Son both are in those dimensions, comes forth the Spirit of God that comforts, warms, uh, gives knowledge, gives leadership. There's only one. Gregory from Illinois, can I get some advice on anointing my wife and myself with oil? Well, it, yes, of course. Uh, the oil, as it is written in James chapter 5, is the olive oil, and it is the oil of our people. You, are, you can go to any grocery store, basically, and buy virgin olive oil or pure olive oil, whichever. Pour a little, in, use part of it to cook with. It's most healthy, one of the most healthy cooking oils there is. But 
use, pour a little in a vial and ask our Father to bless it as anointing oil. And then you put a little tab on your finger, touch the forehead uh, of the wife and yourself and ask God's blessings upon you with the anointing and make the request for whatever it may be. The oil doesn't accomplish it. It is your obedience to use it that gets God's attention. Many might say, well, I, didn't, I, didn't, I thought that was Old Testament. I didn't know Christians were supposed to do that. Well, you've never read the book of John, have you, in the New Testament? But then, really, you would be a little bit on the bad, uh, you know, lack of knowledge side, and that destroys people. If you didn't know what Christ means, Christos in the manuscripts, Christ means the anointed one. And the etymology of his name comes from as rubbing with the oil of our people. So Christians should anoint and be anointed. Uh, Melinda from Indiana. In Deuteronomy 41, in the Song of Moses, why would he reward the ones who hate him? Reward them with what? I mean, he is going to reward them by thumping their gourd. You know, judgment has both sides. For we that serve him honestly and faithfully, there is riches in love, spirit, and, and um, comfort from him. But judgment at the same time can mean punishment. He's going to reward them with punishment those that hate him you leave God out of the equation he will leave you out of his will and you will inherit nothing other than hell itself that's what he's going to inherit them reward them with reward them with a lot of fire God is a consuming fire it it um, those that go into that lake of fire <clears throat> they don't burn forever and ever and ever he blots them out. They turn to ashes. You won't even remember they existed. Therefore, you cannot shed a tear for them because they, the same has never existed. Alan from Oklahoma, where in the Bible does it tell us we will be able to go to the other side of the gulf to help our loved ones? Well, it, 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 um, the gulf is now, Luke chapter 16. But in the millennium, Christ returns to this earth and sets up teaching here. And, and um, it is written, Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end of Ezekiel is all about the millennium. There's more about the millennium, that's the Lord's day, in the book of Ezekiel than any other book in the Bible. And in chapter 44, verses 20 through 25, he lets you know that if you are one of God's elect, that's the Zadok in the Hebrew tongue, you can go and help a blood relative, and, and so it is. And uh, that's one of the rewards of being one of God's elect. You, well, how do you help them? You tell them they get their act together or they're going to hell. Final. Period. And, and work with them on that. Michael from Washington. What does the name Joshua mean in the Bible? Um, there are no J's in the Hebrew alphabet. Therefore, the correct spelling is Y-A-S-H-U-A, -S Yahshua, which it means Yahweh's Savior. That is Jesus in the Hebrew tongue, Yeshua. And Jesus being this, meaning the same thing, in English, Yahweh's Savior, God's Savior. That is his job. Uh, Billy from Georgia, when was Satan sent back to heaven with the fallen angels for Michael to hold him there? Well, when was the last time he was reported really other than spiritually? It was in the wilderness with Christ. He was there. Where did Christ tell him to go? Behind me. Christ is on the throne, and right behind that, Michael's got him. Locked in until it's time to test people out here on earth whether they've done their homework or not. Because Michael's kicking him out, and he's coming here as 
Savior. He's coming here as instead of Christ. That's what the word means, Antichrist. Instead of Christ. Claiming to be Christ. To rapture people away. And Paul makes it very clear in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, don't you let my first letter deceive you about gathering back to Christ. It's not going to happen until after the son of perdition, Satan, stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God in the world, trying to whore after him. It, God's word is very complete on this. It's whether you've read it or not. I just quoted 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Lester from Tennessee. What is the firmament? The firmament fell, and what did it cause? I mean, it washed out the catabo that washed out everything. Gorges, the Grand Canyon. It was water that was above us that protected this earth from cold, and it was fertile all the way around, North Pole, South Pole. We have, we have found mammoths with flesh still on them with buttercups in their mouth in the tundra of Alaska. It was beautiful there. And uh, when the firmament fell, the jet stream came into being and storm. And, and true north and magnetic north now are 90, mile, 90, 90 miles apart. According to what part of the earth you're on as a pilot, you have to make corrections to your magnetic compasses. Either east is least and west is best. In other words, you, if west you add and east you subtract from your heading or you won't end up in the right place. Why? Because of the catabol. <clears throat> Teresa from Florida. In Revelation 21, I think, why does the Bible say there will be no more sea? Well, for the simple fact, the earth will be rejuvenated and the firmament will go back where it came from. And, and uh, it, it is the protection where it leaves this globe eternally fertile and beautiful and um, both north and south. Therefore, there is plenty of land for every soul God created to inhabit it. And so it will be. What a beautiful time that we have to look forward to. Okay, we've got uh, Barbara from Maine. I am 81 years old and I don't drive anymore. How can I help serve my Lord in my daily life except pray for them each day. Well, that, that's, that's a lot, okay? I don't feel I am serving him as I, well as I should. I would appreciate your input on this. I think you're doing just fine. <clears throat> and listen, we're coming up to that time that all God's elect are going to be delivered up to for the false Messiah. You're going to let the Holy Spirit speak through you. That's a lot. That's God's battle axe. That's God using his own people to straighten things out. When Satan is here crying, peace, 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 God's elect will straighten things out. God doing it, of course, the Holy Spirit being the power. Ken from Tennessee. In the scriptures, I recall the reference to the great falling away. Perhaps you have covered this before, and I missed it, but could this mean that those who are counted on a counting on a pre-tribulation rapture, giving up believing in God when they are not raptured out of here. Well, that's uh, unfortunately, you're talking about the falling away, which is the great, the word in the Greek is apostasy. It means people changing uh, their faith and belief in one instant when Antichrist stands in Jerusalem and they think it's the true Christ return. Oh, they're going to be so joyful. They're going to be so happy. Christ has returned. There's just one thing. They haven't, the falling away, Paul makes it very clear. I just quoted it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They're going to be, don't, even, don't get in their way. They'll be over rejoicing. The second advent has happened. There's just one problem. It's the wrong Jesus. It's instead of Christ. And many that haven't done their homework will worship Satan and still expect Christ to take them. What a shame. How embarrassed they will be. I feel sorry for them. Donnie from... Where is Donnie from? Donnie is from... 
Well, we'll just have to leave that part off. Um, my name is Donnie from, oh, from South Carolina. What should I do when all the churches here preach the rapture? Please help us. Also, where in the Bible can I find out about the divide gulf? I said, well, the gulf that divides is, you'll find it in Luke 16 between the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Um, you're in church when you're in church with us. And if there's a group of you that study, start a home study and study yourself. Study the Word of God in truth and be blessed. Shepherd's Chapel ministry was started in a home. And uh, it grew into what it is. So start your own. Well, what kind of paperwork do I need? It's called the Word of God. That's all the paperwork you need. Start it. I, I would hasten to say there are certain cities now that are so anti-God that you want to check city ordinances, but there's nothing wrong with discussing God's. Nobody's going to take that freedom away from us. I don't care what kind of ordinance they pass. Of people getting together and talking about the Word of God, but do know with eyes wide open, always be wiser than the serpent, but as peaceful as a dove. And... The dove protects their nest. They're wicked. Uh, Mark from Kansas. I have been studying with you for a while now, and I have a question in the Bible. What is the, what is the devil's name? I sure don't want to. I sure don't want to like these names. Well, I'm sure you wouldn't. Probably uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse six and seven, gives you a list of his names. Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 and 3 give you a list of his names. In Daniel chapter 7, if you happen to have a strong uh, a, um, companion Bible, it lists many of the names that Satan uses. He's a play actor. Do you know, do you know what the word play actor is in the Greek? It's hypocrite. Okay. It means somebody playing or pretending to be some, a role of something they're not. Well, that's what Satan is. He plays many roles. He wants to play the role of Christ. That's why he's called instead of Christ. You know, it, it, um, it is so simple to follow the true Christ and avoid the false. You'll, you'll do just fine. You'll, spiritually, you, discernment will do that for you anyway. Robin from Alabama. I worry that I am not attending a church or that I am not sending my children every Sunday. I'm studying with Shepherd's Chapel every day at 5 a.m. via television. Um, that, that's, we are a church. Our broadcasts are an extension of, that, of the church. So when, when you are studying God's Word, that is church. That's what a church is supposed to do. A building that holds meetings that may call itself a church and it never gets around to teaching God's Word, it's not really a church. It's a gathering place. It's when God's Word is taught. That makes the difference. Richard from California. How do you spell Kenites, the descendants of Cain? K-E-N-I-T-E-S, Kenites. It, it, um, in, in the Hebrew tongue, the dialect is Kayan, is, is the father. And Canaanites is the offspring thereof. Uh, you, could, you can find the word in many places. You can find it in First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. Do you know what the Canaanites were doing then? Way, way back in Chronicles chapter 1, verse 55. They were, chapter 2, First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. They were scribes for Judah. The very people that this book of Jeremiah is written to. They were keeping books for them, keeping the records, making the manuscripts. That's where you find them. You'll find them again in Jeremiah 35 here before too long. We'll be talking about them by their father's name, Yonatab. Um, this, I'm helping Man Mancia, I will say, uh, from Wisconsin. I have a question about tithing. I am an independent contractor and taxes are not taken out for me. 
I've been tithing 10% of my income without taxes being taken out. I want to give my 10% of God's kingdom, but I wonder if I'm doing what is right. You only, you only tithe on what you personally receive, not your business necessarily. And even if it is, if you tithe on the business, which some people do, only what is profit. If the taxes have to be taken out, that's not profit. Okay. All expenses, all taxes, everything must come out before you know what profit there is. And that is yours. The rest of it is the government or expenses that it takes to transfer. In other words, if I, I will just simplify this. Let's say I'm an apple peddler. Okay. And I got a wagon load of apples here. If, if I, and that's my business, that's the way I feed my family. If I give all my apples away, I'm out of business. I can't do anything. I can't be a blessing to my family. I can't be a blessing to God. You only tithe on what you absolutely have that is yours, uh, yourself. And, and if you're retired and on a fixed income, that even changes then. Okay. You've already paid your tithe on that, and and so it is. So you, then you give a love offering, a pit, a, you know, to to keep God's word coming. I'm out of time. Hope that helps you. All right. Hey, um, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's word, reading it, studying it, living it. But you know what? Most of all, God loves you for it. It makes His day. It truly does. And when you, I'm talking to you, when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. You're blessed indeed. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, and only if we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. Now, most important, though, listen to me. Good. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The book of St. John, what a fantastic book we have here in tape for you, for your convenience of studying as you drive or whatever the case might be in the comforts of your own home. St. John, the writer of Revelation as well as this great book of St. John. John taught in a way that he not only interpreted, translated the word, and, and interpreted, fully translated the names as well as other things that made this word, this book, so easy to understand, helping the very reader see Christ in his work as God, Savior of the world. This book of John giving you the identity of the Kenites as well as those events that would transpire in the end generation. That's your generation, beloved.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get into our Father's Word. And what are we studying? The gardens of God. Now we have covered the first, second, the third. As a matter of fact, we stopped in the third. We're going to go to the fourth and the fifth in this lecture when we complete the third. If you will remember, I stated that... Um, Gain in the Hebrew tongue is garden, and it simply means.